Welcome to the Beehive Startups Town Hall. We have Zenefit CEO Parker Conrad and Representative John Notwell with us today. Uh, before I get to them, I just want to give everyone a brief synopsis of what we're even talking about here. I know some of you know the details of this, and it may not be you know necessary, but there are some who probably don't know exactly why Zenefits was banned in the first place. Uh, and how this all abandoned Utah at least and how this all works. So I'm just going to give a brief synopsis here. On November 20th, 2014, Utah Insurance Commissioner Todd Kaiser sent a letter to Zenefits ordering the startup to either shut down its free online platform in Utah or impose a surcharge on its local small business clients. And you guys, uh, Parker and John, feel free to step in if I say something wrong here. Uh, that letter stated the Utah Insurance Department had been receiving complaints that Zenefits was offering services and I wrote down the code here, that are prohibited under like 31A, 23A, 402.5 of Utah's insurance code. So it gets a little technical when you have that many numbers and points. Uh, that section of Utah's uh, insurance code deals with insurance marketing and rebates. Um, to their credit though, Governor Herbert's office and members of the Utah State Legislature quickly responded to growing concern from Utah startup and tech community and to articles Beehive Startups and other publications were writing. And Representative John Notwell, who's with us today, introduced HB 141, which was supported by Governor Herbert and recently sailed through both the Utah House and Senate. Uh, just to give you some background on what HB 141 does, it basically says that Zenefits and others can offer free or low-cost gifts to potential customers, provided that they disclose that recipient, recipients are not obligated to buy in insurance in order to keep the gifts. So that's kind of the background. Again, want to welcome Zenefit CEO Parker Conrad, Utah Representative John Notwell, to this BI Startup Sound Town Hall. Thank you both for being here. Uh, we only have 30 minutes, so I just want to quickly jump into questions. Representative Notwell, uh, the first thing I do is why? Why did you introduce HB 141, which uh, effectively allows Zenefits to operate in Utah like it does in the other 49 states? Yeah, great, Clint. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the answer is is you summed it up pretty well. I mean, when when I saw it erupt uh, in, in the social media sphere, uh, being somebody who's in technology in Utah, you know, these types of things um, reflect poorly on our brand as a state, as a state that is trying desperately to attract high-tech, good-paying jobs into Utah. And... Uh, you know, it was it was pretty obvious to me when evaluating the business model that this this is something that is innovative, it's disruptive in the market, and it's a place where Utah wants to be in, in terms of of uh, the again the kinds of technology that we want to bring here. So for, from my point of view, I wanted to start the conversation about what can we do to fix it uh, because I didn't see a reason why somebody shouldn't be allowed to purchase insurance, you know, either through a you know a hub like portal or you know, through their insurance agent directly as they've been doing for years. Uh, Parker, and I wanted to wear the BI Starts beanie that your people wouldn't let you wear when you spoke at Start SLC. I wish I would have. I'm just remembering that that was my plan all along. Uh, so, Parker, to date, Utah is the only state in the country that has banned Zenefits. Um, did that surprise you when it first came out, when you first learned that you were banned in Utah? Um, it, it did because I know you know Utah has has such a reputation for being so you know pro business. Um, <clears throat> what what I will say is you know listen like I mean I, I make mistakes all the time um, and I think like uh, what what was really impressive about Utah is that is that uh, the state like sort of changed this or fixed this so quickly. I mean I was just amazed <clears throat> you know at, at how how quickly this all happened and. I think it's a real testament to the state that um, you know that um, that you know they they kind of looked at this and Representative Notwell and the governor and others said, "Hey, this is this is not the way we want to do business here," and and uh, and moved so quickly. I mean, I was uh, <clears throat> I, I was just like super impressed by that. Yeah, there are certain things that we uh, go slow on, but Zen this benefits thing uh, doesn't seem to be one of them. We were all over this from the very beginning, which is which was actually really great to see. Uh, Representative or not, well, there are some, particularly those in the Utah insurance business, who think HB 141 uh, is giving Zenefits special treatment. Let's just kind of knock that out of the out of the way in the beginning. Do you believe that's the case? I don't. In fact, um, you know, as we went through the negotiation on this bill, um, there were many of the insurance community that were a part of it, and I mean, obviously. Uh, a, a part of the negotiation and the discussion. And I think one of the things that you find is that when 
when you really get into the guts of it, you find that these insurance brokers, uh, in particular agents, uh, in addition, they really want to do something like this. And I think that they're looking for how do we make sure that the that if it's going to be available to uh, Zenefits, it should be available to all. So how do we do that? How do we make sure that everyone has an opportunity to participate in this? And I think to me that's one of the great victories here is that uh, it's it's available to everyone. And certainly, you know, Zenefits is one company that's going to benefit probably more immediately uh, than others. But I, you know, Parker, I'm sure knows that uh, as any good tech CEO knows that. There is going to be someone on his heels once they see how great a model it is. There will be others that will follow. Yeah, and there are some in the uh, insurance industry here in Utah who were for this, right? Because they want to do something like what Zenefits is doing. That's right. That's right. There was a big. There was a. There, there were several that said, "Look, we wanted to do this years ago, and we've been we've been following the law. So, uh, you know, we we want to be able to take part of this as well." Parker, uh, like I mentioned before, this kind of became a priority for Governor Herber and Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox and the Utah Legislature, Senator Kurt Bramble and Representative John Notwell. They kind of took this up, saying we're going to pass this this legislative session, um, which was which was really great, obviously for you and and your and your company. What was it like though, working with Representative Notwell here and Governor Herber and his administration? Well, first, first I should say that you know really. <clears throat> the impetus for this really came directly from Representative Notwell. So we sort of like, um, sort of obviously started talking with him eventually, but but it was after, I think, uh, I, mean, I don't know the, the technical terminology, but after he'd sort of like introduced the bill or sort of, you know, said... Open said, the bill file, right. Yeah, so so we, um, it, and, and, and it was, so it was... Um, uh, you know, one thing is it was it was just uh, it was so great to see um, such a, a such an upspring of support both from Representative Notwell, but also um, Clint folks like yourself and and Beehive startups and 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 those folks. Um, and then uh, you know one, once we really got into the into the thick of things, it seemed like you know most folks were fairly uh, you know said hey this makes sense and and we want to move forward and make this change. And what what type of support did you receive, Representative Notwell, from Governor Herbert and his administration? Yeah, so that that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, just to articulate a little bit about what uh, Parker said, I think you know, first of all, I opened the bill file um, after sort of witnessing what happened on uh, on social media, and at that point, then I was contacted by uh, folks that represent Zenefits saying, hey, we understand you've opened a bill file. Perhaps we should talk. We've been working on this for several months. And so I had that conversation and learned that uh, Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox in particular had taken a keen interest in this from his perspective. And so I reached out to him. He's actually a good friend. We served together in the House. We were elected at the same time. Um, so I know him well. And he said, look, I, I can't, we're not going to stick our nose in this. We need to let the legislative process work its way out. We're interested from the governor's office. We're interested in seeing all parties come together and find a solution that works for Utah. And so from that standpoint, he supported me in the effort to go ahead and try to find a fix if there could be one. Uh, throughout the legislative session, uh, I met with uh, Lieutenant Governor a few times, um, you know, both by phone and in person, and the message was the same every time. We're interested in finding a fix here. You know, keep pushing. Let us know what help you might need if you need it. And then when we finished the hearing in the in the House in uh, in business and labor in the House, uh, we passed the the bill that we it wasn't the bill we ended up with, but it was you know mostly the way there. Um, and the governor actually issued a press release, which is pretty rare for him to do, where he uh, congratulated us on the effort that we had made and encouraged the legislature to move with all speed to get it done. So from, from that public vantage point, that was really the only public support that was provided by them. And I, you know, I will say I respect that in the governor's office. They, they don't necessarily need to inject themselves in the legislative process. It's good for them to provide the support when it's needed, but also to allow the process to play out. And, uh, and you know, it played out in, in, in all of our favor. I actually don't know this. Has is, is Governor Herbert actually signed the bill yet? He hasn't. In fact, we're working on a, a ceremonial bill signing where we'll bring uh, really what we're going to, I think we're going to nickname it the disruptive uh, bill signing or something. We're going to bring the, the Zenefits bill forward. We're also going to bring in the Uber Lyft bill uh, to the same meeting. I believe that's our intent. 
and he will ceremonially sign them both at that time. The governor has until middle, the middle of April to sign legislation uh, from the end of the session. And so he's, you know, his, his process to, of how he vets them out is, is pretty simple, but I don't anticipate there be any problem at all with this one in particular. Yeah, we do know that he intends to sign the bill. He, he said that much. Yeah. And, and uh, it would have been awesome, and this kind of brings us to our next question, next question, if Tesla was also in that mix. And I want to ask you, Parker, in the same legislative session where Zenefits, like everything worked out so well for Zenefits, a bill that would have allowed uh, Tesla to open a dealership here in Utah um, failed in the House. And I guess my question is, do you have any advice for Elon Musk and the folks over there at Tesla on how to deal with, like, Governor Herbert and, and the legislature? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, I, to, to be totally honest, I know so. I, you know, I I know so much about like my little sphere of the world, and you know, outside of that, um, uh, you know, I, I think Tesla makes cool cars, but I know very little about you know what the specific sort of legal issues are with them in Utah. Um, so I'm I'm not sure I'm I'm the best person to answer that. But I don't know, Representative Notwell, what uh, maybe maybe you're probably the best person to answer that question. Yeah, you definitely are. And we were talking about it, Representative Notwell, before we came on air a little bit, that, that there's been this uh, kind of a groundswell of negative press around, you know, banning Zenefits, obviously, banning Uber and Lyft. And we've taken care of those two issues, it seems like, now. And now there's this whole, tes whole Tesla thing. Do you see these as kind of just like bumps in the road or as, as something that's more systemic and something that needs to be figured out uh, on like a broader, in, in a broader way? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, Clint. I, let me, let me, I, if I can, maybe I can try to paint for the audience a, a brief picture about why these three bills, why two of them are, why two of them succeeded and one of them failed. And I think, it, in my opinion, it's really mostly about timing. So the Uber Lyft bill, the Zenefits bill, they were started before the session began. They were publicly out there. Uh, you know, the sponsors encouraged a lot of participation in the dialogue. We had, I mean, I'll just speak for the, the bill that I ran, hours of meetings with the various parties to try to find common ground and build a, build a piece of legislation that met those common frameworks. And in the end, we actually, ironically, on my bill, came back to where we began, uh, where we sort of started with, with this notion that if it's free to all, it's not considered an inducement. And the bill changed shape multiple times over the period of the session, and it came back to where we started, where everyone said, and that's actually really the best place to, to have that definition. The Uber Lyft bill was the same way, where you had the insurance department, uh, not, not so much insurance as it was the banking groups that are focused on the liability insurance for the Uber Lyft drivers. You also had the taxi you know, players involved. Of course, this is a city issue, so you had the, the, the League of Cities and Towns here in Utah involved in that conversation as well. The, the stark difference between those two bills and the one dealing with Tesla was that the Tesla bill came out late in the session. I mean, we're talking in the fifth week. Uh, very, It was made public in the fifth week. There wasn't a whole lot of participation from the impacted parties. And it was you know late to try to bring it through committee and then to the House. It came up in the House in the very last week of the session. Um, these types of things are difficult, right? When you're, when you're dealing with an industry, the the you know that has been historically had a certain set of privilege in the state and you want to take that away in five or six days uh, of legislative time it's just difficult to do that and I think many of my colleagues that voted against uh, the bill for Tesla yeah sure some of them were represented by you know some of them have car dealership in their district but most of them don't I mean when you look at the number of districts that have new car dealers in Utah, the vast majority do not have them. We're talking about, you know, probably 20. Uh, but it obviously got more more votes than that. And I think it was really about timing and about process and about the obvious lack of consensus that had been built on the legislation. So I know that over the interim period between now and next January, there will be a lot more discussions and a lot more meetings with that particular bill because there are many like me who say, look, this is another black mark on us that we have to fix. We can't just allow this to continue the way it's going. And as we talked earlier, you know, Tesla, the dealership is really about test drive. It's really what it is because you don't buy the car in person at a Tesla dealership. You, you have to buy it online. Each car, uh, as we heard testimony committee, is basically custom made. 
They produce about 36 cars a year, 36,000 cars a year, and you can't buy it on the lot. So really, the lot serves as an opportunity for people to test drive the car, and as, as a place where service uh, can be rendered when you know there might be a need to, to have a fix. So I think those are issues that really, to me, doesn't it doesn't appear like we have to. We're so far apart, you know, right? They're not trying to sell a car on the lot. So, right, I, Parker. I want to dig into uh, Zenefits here because what's interesting, it is such a disruptive technology and states like Utah are like trying to figure out how to even like handle something like this but you launched in May 2013 so you really have like come out of nowhere. It was reported recently that Zenefits is the fastest growing SaaS startup in history. What's it like scaling a company like that and how are you dealing and overcoming with the, overcoming like growing at such a rapid rate? Well, it's, 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 it's very humbling and nerve-wracking and, and obviously tremendously exciting at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, you know, we've, we're, um, the company is about um, coming up on 1,000 employees now, um, and, uh, have, you know, pretty much all of those have been hired in the last two years. Um, and so th the main way that, that uh, really the only way to do this is to build a really great team. So... Um, you know, um, we've got, you know, I can't take too much credit for it because there are a bunch of people who run various different parts of the company um, that are sort of much less new to this whole thing than I am and, um, and really know what they're doing and have a tremendous amount of experience doing this. Um, so there's a guy named David Sachs who recently joined as COO who went through a lot of the same kind of growth when, when he was COO at PayPal. Um, so that that's that's really sort of most of it is just getting sort of the right the right people in, um, and then just being you know really um, really committed to making sure that however fast we're growing, you know the experience for customers is really great. Um, that none of you know these things are always internally you know chaotic and crazy and all that kind of stuff. But you have to have like a real draw a real solid line that says like none of that spills over into the customer experience. You know as we're sort of dealing with our own growing pains and things like that. Let's talk about David Sachs for a second. Like that was a really bit when that was announced that you had brought him on as COO, that made a lot of headlines. That was a really big hire for you guys. How did that happen? Walk me through how you convinced David Sachs to, to join Zenefits. <clears throat> well, so really it was one of those things that was sort of handed to me on a silver platter. Um, so I think he was, he was talking with um, Mark Andreessen and, and Lars Dalgard from Andreessen Horowitz. Um, about um, you know various different things, and they said, hey, you should you should take a look at Zenefits, and and they've been talking with me about you know hiring CEOs and things like that before, and so they'd had sort of several meetings with him. By the time I met David, he was already like really pumped and excited, um, so I just had to not screw it up. Um, and um, David's a really super sharp guy. Um, obviously, you know has been through this several times before. Um, and so it's it's really great to to have him on board. Do you expect Zenefits to run, continue to run into regulation issues as you grow and as you you know go into other markets? Um, you know, I expect um, we might, or I expect that the issue will come up um, and and continue to come up in various different states, um, <clears throat> largely because. Um, you know, the, the, the insurance market, particularly the insurance brokerage market for companies with less than 500 employees, I think is in the sort of early stages of a very dramatic transition. Um, because I think in, you know, in five to ten years' time, there's no way that companies are going to be doing this via the fax machine. Um, and so, you know, it's very easy to see the end state of this transition. And what it looks like is, you know, all of the insurance companies have – sort of technology hooks and endpoints and things like APIs that, you know, brokers will be able to tie into to administer and, and help with the administration of these policies for their clients. Um, and so what will likely happen is every insurance broker in the next five to ten years will have a real sort of competency and strength in their technology. Um, and that probably means that there will be other companies like Zenefits that have their roots as technology companies that come into the market, and, and maybe some of the existing brokers which will reinvent themselves as technology companies, but every insurance broker out there will be a technology company in the next five to ten years. <clears throat> and that's that will be a, a painful transition for some, um, because many of them will not be able to make that transition. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a natural thing that sort of faced with that, 
a lot of folks will, you know, reach out to state regulators and seek some kind of protection. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that happened in Utah. It's happened in other states as well. To date, you know, that there's no other state where regulators have actually sort of taken action. But I expect that over time, the, the pressure from brokers um, to do something will mount in many of these different states. And so it's something that, you know, we're going to have to be vigilant about and, and probably constantly telling our story about, <clears throat> you know, yes, there, you know, these transitions, you know, create a lot of pain for many people in the industry. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, this kind of transition is something that's really good for small business as a whole and can make, you know, the industry a lot more efficient, make things a lot easier, <clears throat> and just make this this whole process of, like, managing benefits a lot less painful for many, many businesses out there. Representative Notwell, what's your take on the rapid growth of technology and startups here in Utah? And what is your – how do you view the state government's role in – helping that, you know, the startup and tech scene here in Utah continue to grow and to continue to flourish? Wow, that's a, that's a really big question, Clint. I, I would, <laughs> here's what I would say. I, I think that when you look at, there was a recent article published in, uh, and I believe, I believe it was uh, the New York Times, but don't quote me on that, about a, a study that was conducted over a multi-year period about why Utah in particular, uh, why we have this uh, economy that, didn't suffer as dramatically during their Great Recession as others, why we have such a low unemployment, uh, and why we continue to grow at, at the, the pace that we're growing. And you can point to a lot of things, right? We have a commitment to uh, a culture here, and, and I don't necessarily mean the predominant religious culture, but I mean we have a, a commitment to a culture in the workplace that enables people to have a, an appropriate work-life balance. We have, uh, you know, we've made massive investments in uh, infrastructure when it comes to transportation, uh, both in a multimodal fashion with, with our transit network and in addition to trying to pave the way to, uh, to make driving on the road a, a little less uh, painful than it is in other parts of the country. Uh, we have a tax system that favors uh, uh, individuals coming to work here. It's, we have a, a non-progressive, a, a simple tax um, that is, you know, makes that, you know, uh, powerful. And then I think when you look at Utah, when you think about Utah, most people think about our recreation, and that's clearly one of the draws here. We have uh, a, a lot of ability for people, especially in this coming into the spring months here, where people can ski on one, uh, on, uh, ski, golf, and boat on the same day. Uh, there, there's not a lot of places where you can do that, and so we have a really active uh, community that likes to participate in that. And, I mean, you just you look at the people that are here, the kinds of uh, uh, employees that we're producing out of our local universities. Um, these are the types of things that, that draw people here. And I think you asked, the, you asked a really important question, which is what, what can the state government do to, to empower that? I think the first thing we need to do is get out of the way. Um, and that's, unfortunately, that's where government tends to fail more than anything else. Is we, we tend to get in the way. And I think our ability to loosen the marketplace for uh, innovation and disruption is one of our more, most important roles. And that is our way of getting out of the way. And I think we can need to continue to uh, to make the investments in infrastructure, make the investments in uh, in our people, in our students. And these are things that we do well. And as long as we continue to do that and stay out of the way, I think we're going to continue to draw um, a lot of great businesses here. Uh, you know, where I work right now, I'm obviously in the tech space, and where I work, we're growing like crazy. This uh, this area, Thanksgiving Point, and uh, and then soon to be uh, likely in, in north of the point of the mountain in Draper. These areas are going to become magnets for uh, tech companies in particular, startups uh, secondarily, all the things that make you talk great. So we just need to continue to do the right things. And Parker, having spoken at, spoken at Start SLC, and thanks again for doing that, um, and having worked with uh, Utah's government now, what's kind of your take on Utah as a startup and technology hub? And actually, I mean, being from Silicon Valley kind of, the uh, you know worldwide hub for startups and technology. How do you view Utah in in that context? Gosh, well, I think it's great. I mean, in my view, the the real measure of the state on this stuff is how is how quickly they they address these kinds of issues when they come up. Because you know, listen, there are always going to be bumps in the road anywhere. Um, and so I was just super impressed by that. Um, and I you know like Clint visiting your event at Start SLC it was really it was really cool to see just how, how many companies there are in Salt Lake City that are doing this kind of stuff. And, 
Um, now, having been to that event, I've seen those like start SLC T-shirts at a couple of other other conferences. <clears throat> um, like when I, I was talking at uh, Jason Calcanis's launch conference, and saw someone in the front row like wearing the start SLT, SLC T-shirt. So it, it's clear that um, you know there's a there's a really great group of folks um, on Silicon Slopes. Um, and I think you know. Listen, you know, when we were when we were looking to open a second office, you know, we we looked very closely at Salt Lake City, and you know, then we ran into some like regular the regulatory problems. We we ended up going to Arizona, but I would I would not be surprised if, you know, at, at the point at which we're opening our next next office, I would love to do it in Salt Lake. I think it would be just such a great place to to have a presence. That's hey, awesome. Parker, we're we're ready for you. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> Well, thanks. I don't. I know you guys both are busy and had to go, and that we've kind of reached our cutoff point. I want to thank you both for coming. Uh, congratulations on getting this bill through. Thanks a lot, Parker. I'm sure we'll see both of you down the road. Uh, that's it. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a bunch.